Quite a few will be familiar with City London, but I will run through the background um, of the trust in my presentation initially before I go on to talk about how I'm seeing the markets and how we're currently positioned. Uh, so, City of London, as you know, will probably know its objective is to grow shareholders' income and capital over the long term. Uh, one of the key features of investment trusts is having an independent board of directors, and our directors, we have five directors, and they serve each for about nine years and then they rotate to keep their independence. The chairman is Solori Magnus, who has a background in corporate finance. We're the biggest investment trust in our sector, UK equity income, with 1.84 billion of net assets. And we've been popular with investors, including AJ Bell's clients um, over the years. We've issued a lot of new shares, but we only issue them at a premium to net asset value, a small premium around 2%. Um, but we have also, if we do fall to discount, as we did in September 2020, we, we bought back in shares at a 2% discount. So it kind of mirrored the 2% premium that we issue shares at. I'm part of the uh, Janice Henderson Global Equity team. I'm actually the oldest member of the team. I just turned 61, but James Henderson is only about two weeks younger than me. So he, he's the same age as me. And we've kind of been around the track a few times, but we've got great colleagues who are kind of mid, some of whom mid-career, some of whom Kind of near the beginnings of their career and they, they some of them have much better perspective on kind of how society is changing than, than we do um the key person in the team is david smith for city of london because he's the third he's in the first column third row down he's the deputy fund manager of city of london he also manages henderson high income and the uk portfolio of bankers investment trust um i'm proud to be in city's manager now for 31 years absolutely unbelievable i was i was only age 30 when i started it was the year i got married as well um, but I've, you know, hugely proud of um, being manager for, for City for such a long time. I'm a huge, you know, massively believe in, in the trust. Um, the management fee is only 0.325%, so the total expense ratio is 0.38, which is the lowest in our sector, and it's very competitive for an actively managed fund, and that is sort of um, something that kind of an independent board can negotiate. I turn to my investment philosophy, and I won't go into any huge detail but it is valuation driven i i believe that share price valuation is, is important i'm looking to be in companies that can grow their dividends and profits over the long term uh, but i don't want to overpay for stocks and in recent years i mean growth has really been the dominant theme until this year um but this year there's been a much greater appreciation of share price valuation which has helped our performance a lot um over the last um few months uh, so i start with dividend yield but i look a whole range of um share price valuation i do my own research but i'm also helped by some excellent analysts that we have at Genesis henson both here in london and also in america where we're, we're headquartered actually in denver colorado um the other feature of the portfolio is that you know i'm a pretty conservative guy and the portfolio obviously reflects my conservative personality and i like companies with good cash generation they're best able to pay their dividends and support capital expenditure in the long term. And I like companies with strong balance sheets, particularly for cyclical companies. You've got a combination of you know, high leverage, high debts, and the economy turning down. That's very dangerous for, for a lot of cyclical companies. So I try to try to avoid that. Um, ESG, I mentioned that stock and it's a big thing, theme in markets, environmental, social governance. I mean, we we're not an ESG fund. Um, we don't exclude sectors. You'll see our biggest holdings actually British American tobacco, but we look at the valuation. Is it you know, obviously, British Bank of Tax is always going to be on a low valuation, but is it really too low? And it has actually been performing very well recently because it probably got too cheap because of uh, some of the ESG concerns. Um, moving on to performance, um, performance has actually been very strong recently, uh, as you'll see on page um, on, on this slide, and we're 13.7% to the end of uh, May, this is. Um, uh, compared with 8.3% for our benchmark, the all share index, main index, for the um, UK market. And uh, we're also ahead of um, both the equity income sector at 4.7 and, and the OIC sector, equivalent OIC sector at 5.5. And, and, you know, our, our fund is really, you know, I'm never going to shoot the lights out in the raging bull market, but in more turbulent times, you know, our, our defensive conservative type of portfolio, I'll talk more about the portfolio, is, is kind of well suited. And uh, but in the long run, the, the chart at the top shows you 
um, the performance since I began managing the fund in 1991. You can see we're well ahead of the index, but I certainly don't perform in every year. There are years, you know, when, when it's led by zero yielding growth stocks, right, where we're not going to keep up necessarily with the market. But at the moment, we are ahead of the benchmark index over one, three, five, and 10 years, as, as you can see. So uh, talking about um, some of the activity, I mean, I'll go into a bit more about the portfolio, but these are examples of um, stocks that have come into the portfolio, come out of the portfolio in the 11 months to 31st of May. I, we're a 30th of June financial year end, so I kind of look at the year in that, in that kind of um, bookending it, 1st July, 30th of June, which is slightly unusual. Um, but we've um, just looking at the sales first, which come from, we've had a couple of takeovers, um, uh, Daily Mail in general and William Morrison, so they both left the portfolio. And actually, we've had a more recent one, Bruin Dolphin, which um, has been taken over as well. Um, so they're, they're, that's all good. Um, we still got some Bruin Dolphin that, that, that doesn't look phased until the end of this quarter. Um, then two less good stocks were Go Ahead, the Transportation Group, where, which was not a good one. And we actually, at one stage, it got delisted because of some issues with um, its accounting. But we um, sold it ahead of that. Um, and then Hammerson, which we actually, um, as it turns out, I mean, we lost money in it. It's, it's a, it owns some shopping malls, but we um, we sold it out. We sold it quite well before its latest um, fall. We do have to have some exposure to land securities in British land in the REIT sector. Um, in terms of new holdings, I've bought um, 3i Group, which is actually an investment trust, but it invests in private companies. It's got a particularly big holding of a discount retailer in Europe called Action, and it's got a very good track record in recent times and some other kind of growth private companies looks interesting. Wholesome is a Swiss-based international building materials stock on about a 14 times PE. Sanofi is French-based, but a global um, pharmaceutical stock. I quite like pharmaceutical at the moment. That's a very steady sector in an economic downturn. Hayes is a employment agency. It's about a third in the UK, a third in Australia and New Zealand, and a third in Germany. And, um, they're actually with, you know, doing very well at the moment and, and they benefit from wage growth and, and it's got a very strong balance sheet. And finally, Wynn Canton's a logistics company on a um, very reasonable valuation, which um, provides e-fulfillment for and as part of its business for, for clients. Um, I'll talk a bit about the revenue side. Obviously, we're very proud of our long-term dividend record. We've grown the dividend every year for 55 years. And I say the year uh, into in the first part of the pandemic was the hardest part of my um, whole career in terms of dividends. Um, but we've had a massive bounce back and um, we, we've actually declared our, our, our third interim dividend um, for, for this year. And at the time, you know, we set the dividend for this year, which will be up 2.6%, which is mostly below inflation, but, but our long-term record is ahead of inflation. Uh, but we, the board also announced that we expect our revenue to be fully covered um, by earnings. Um, and with a surplus covered to revenue reserves. So it has been quite a dramatic recovery. I mean, the, the certainly the year, to, we, we've really used the investment trust structure to grow our dividend. I mean, we've got a core of consistent companies, but as you probably know, in, in the bad years of dividends, we're able to draw from our reserve, whilst in the good years, we put money back into reserves. So um, in my of my 30 years up to now, um, 21, we've put money back into reserves and nine, we've taken money out of reserves. To give you a flavour of um, how the revenue has been going recently, our most recent reported results were to the end of half year, to the end of December. And at that point, our EPS was up 23% compared with the previous year and 4% better than six months ahead of uh, pre-pandemic. So we are now ahead of where we were pre-pandemic, which is a big, big relief. And um, I can assure you it was, you know, very trying in that first stage of the pandemic when there were kind of widespread dividends across the market. And that's to benefit the investor trust structure. I mean, all the open-ended funds would have had to cut their dividends during that period, but we were able to lean on our reserves and continue growing our dividend for our shareholders. And the chart there just shows you the very long-term record back to 1966 of, of growing our dividend every single year. Um, I'll talk a bit about the market background. I mean, the UK until recently was kind of underperforming other, other markets, and um, the top chart shows you the the world index, excluding the UK, and then the, then the FTSE all share. I think there are a variety of factors, and partly it's because the world index is dominated by the big American shares in the American stock market, led by kind of lights and Microsoft, Amazon and Apple, which have done extraordinarily well. But the UK has done a lot better this year and shown 
some some resilience as, as some of the kind of valuations got overcooked on those technology shares and the UK's virtues have, have come out and um, there have been a lot of takeovers in the UK we've benefited from it in our portfolio that just shows you the value that has been in the UK market and I believe continues to be the case. Um, now talking a bit about um, market valuation um, the price earnings ratio is one one way we look at the market and that's been coming down the top chart just shows you um, the PE against the long-term average. So we are now comfortably below the long-term average, which is a good sign. Um, the yield on the market is on the bottom chart. The, the, the red line at the top is still well above 30-year gilts, 10-year gilts, and UK base rate. And obviously, interest rates are rising finally. Um, but still, despite the rises we've had, um, they're still um, way below where equities are yielding. And despite the fact that dividends are growing, so I would say the market's still quite good value on a yield basis. Um, I have to say the economic backdrop is quite difficult. Um, as you know, inflation's hit 9.1% both here and in, in the US. Um, and also growth is slowing. I mean, uh, GDP was actually down in May. It's, it bounced back a bit in June. But clearly, uh, the cost of living crisis is going to put a break on, on the economy. Um, and, um, and in addition, central banks, having thought that originally the inflation we were getting was transitory, was the word, uh, are now realizing it's a bit more of a problem. And, and so that you are seeing increasing interest rates and they're also they're stopping their purchase of bonds, which they've done to kind of support liquidity. And so I think that's quite a um, headwind for markets. Um, so I'm quite cautious. And obviously, you've got the war in Ukraine, which is uh, ca carrying on. So uh, so big yield advantage for, for equities. But our gearing is actually, you know, which is we, we use in a conservative way. It's, it's kind of lower than it has been and sort of around 7.8 percent at the end of May. So um, so. Overall, our portfolio is a sort of conservative portfolio. So, um, I, I, but I'm taking a pretty cautious approach at the moment. Uh, in terms of the characteristics of, of the portfolio, um, we have about 86 holdings and we're predominantly in the FTSE 100. Um, but uh, we're quite small in the rest of the UK, only about 14% in kind of UK mids and small cap. But we have got some 15% overseas listed. So we can get up to 20% overseas listed. We've got some very interesting. Come to, I did buy Microsoft about 10 years ago, and that's been extremely successful um, overseas. That gives a bit of extra diversification. I just wanted to draw out two themes in, in, the, sec in the portfolio. I mean, 20% is what is you call consumer staples, which is the sort of selling and manufacture of everyday goods. It includes um, companies like Diageo, which makes alcoholic beverages the biggest in the US, with, um, and it's also taken a lead in tequila which is it which has been a big success it's, its original strength being big whiskey with johnny walker scotch whiskey um i as i mentioned we got bat and imperial brands in the tobacco sector which have been ridiculously cheap they've had a very good year so far that, that they're very dependable in terms of earnings and um but the free cash flow dividends are still very high and so I'm, I'm holding on to those stocks at the moment it also includes tesco's in um supermarket um, Nestle, which is the Swiss based, the biggest food company in the world, very big in pet food and, and confectionery. Um, and then the other sector I wanted to mention was um, insurance and financial services. I mean, here there's been bid activity with the Bruin Dolphin financial service. I've actually halved that holding now as it's at the takeout price. And Schroeder is where the non voting shares have been in franchise. We've seen a good gain there. But I think there's a lot of value in insurance financial services, something the UK does well. Um, our stocks look cheap compared to international competitors. I mean, RSA in the insurance sector was taken over a couple of years ago by a combination of a Canadian and Scandinavian insurance company on issuing more highly rated paper. And so I think there's tremendous value in this area in the UK market and very good dividends as well. I mean, looking at the top 10, it's it's pretty global. Um, you can see a, you know, a couple of consumer staples in the top three, BAT and Diageo. BA Systems has had a very strong yeah, that's our biggest defense contract. But also, it's got an even bigger business in the US. It's the fifth biggest defense contract for the United States. And um, share price has been woefully undervalued. But it's taken, sadly, a war in Ukraine for people to wake up to what a good company it is. And um, it's our fourth biggest holding. Relix is a kind of business information, legal information uh, company, which has been a very strong compounder over the years. But you'll be familiar with you know, our top 10. We've got Shell at number two, benefiting from the strength in the oil price. Rio Tinted's paid some spectacular dividends with the strength of iron ore and copper in recent years. National Grid's our biggest utility and also decent business in the US. 
uh, so the top 10 makes up 30% of the portfolio, 30.7, and then the next 10 uh, makes up 21.6%. Um, you know, you've got another minor, the Anglo-American SSE is a utility, it's the biggest renewable energy company in the UK uh, with big wind interests and also hydroelectric business um, out there, M&G and legal in general, both in the life insurance, financial services type area, as is Phoenix. So, um, and GlaxoSmithKline have got a breakup coming up with um, the consumer healthcare uh, division being uh, split from, from the pharmaceuticals. So we'll get, we'll get two different shares uh, towards the end of this month. So I wanted to leave plenty of time for, for questions, um, but um, the trust, um, you know, I just want to leave you with kind of three messages. It's 55 years of annual dividend increases. It's the longest record of any investment trust. In fact, we don't know of any other UK listed company with a longer record. There are some in America uh, with longer records, a few, but uh, very few. Uh, so immensely proud of our record. We've achieved it but through having a core uh, of consistent companies, but also um, through using the investor trust structure and, and our revenue reserves. We've got very low charges, um, ongoing charge of 0.38%, the lowest in our sector and very low, lower than any open-ended fund and very low for an actively managed fund. And finally, um, we've outperformed in the long run. We've outperformed over the 31 years I've been manager and we've outperformed also short term. We've had a very good performance through this more turbulent period. So at this stage, um, I'm very happy to take questions and I hand it back to Roland. Super. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for all the questions that you've sent in so far. A few key themes coming out. So diving straight in. Um, do you think the FTSE All Share will continue to outperform other world markets over the next few years, given macroeconomic changes and your quality value uh, portfolio? Uh, sorry, is, is is the portfolio well placed during this time after years of growth outperforming? Well, um, in terms of the first part, yeah, I mean, UK has been outperforming. It hasn't been quite so good if you look at it in dollar terms because the pound has fallen about 7 or 8% against the dollar this year, but it's still as, even if taking that into consideration, it's still been outperforming. I mean, a fund manager from one of the growth houses said a couple of years ago, the UK had a 19th century index, and it meant because it was full of things like banks and tobacco companies and, and oil companies in particular. And, um, and we've discovered the world still needs oil, people still smoke, and, you know, traditional banks still have the role. So, um, so it has been, you know, I think there has been you know, growth had an incredible run. I mean, in recent years, growth has just stormed ahead and I think it just got overextended. So I think City's portfolio, you know, I, you know, has really benefited this year and, and I think that trend is set to continue. In particular, you know, the, the, the growth stocks, particularly companies which are actually loss making and some of them had extraordinary valuations, are very dependent on kind of very cheap, interest, very low interest rates and there's the so-called discount rate, um, which is really the 10-year gilt yield. And, and that has gone up a lot this year, and, and that has really undermined the valuation of a lot of these growth stocks, particularly kind of loss making or companies expect to make profits in the future. So uh, I don't see that trend stopping in the, at all at the moment. I think interest rates are just getting back to kind of more normal levels. So, um, so I'm certainly positive on City's portfolio, but you'd expect me to say that for sure. <laughs> and a couple of questions on. Um... UK and the uh, rest of the world. So the first part was, would you ever consider changing or would the trust ever consider changing to a global mandate um, from the UK? And in the same theme, um, what's the kind of maximum minimum exposure to UK and overseas? I think you mentioned it earlier, but just to kind of re reconfirm that. Yes, we're not going to go over 20% overseas listed. Um, and we, no, we're very happy to be UK. We think it's a great stock market. I um, it's got a very open system of corporate control in the UK. So when it gets too cheap, you get takeovers, as, as we've seen and, and we've benefited from. And you've got very high standards of corporate governance in the UK. So, yeah, no way will we leave the UK. No, we're, we'll definitely stay a UK fund. But uh, having said that, a lot of the big UK companies are really global companies, like Rio Tinto has almost no business in, in the UK. I mean, if you go through our te te top 10, most of them are, BAT's got almost no business in the UK, most of them are global companies. So I think there's no reason. I mean, pharmaceuticals, you know, we've got, Merck of the US, um, Johnson & Johnson, Novartis, and, and more recently Sanofi, you know, I like the sector, rather than just being focused on AstraZeneca and Glaxo, I think there's a benefit to having some diversification in some of these sectors, so with overseas listed, but no, we're going to stay UK fund, very proud to be. 
Uh, next up, a uh, question about the recent um, 3i um, purchase. What features did you like about 3i in contrast with other private equity trusts? Well, one particular feature is, I mean, it's got an incredible track record under Simon Borrows, who's been chief executive there for, I think, about 10 years, like over 10 years. And he's a master personal stake in 3i of around 200 million pounds. And um, he doesn't have any, he doesn't get into the so-called carried interest from the underlying investment. So he's, he is completely aligned with um, us as outside shareholders. And so I think in one, his reward is going to come from the dividend. So I would expect um, personally um, some good dividend growth from 3i going ahead. But that's just one facet to distinguish it from many other. It also doesn't have a um, time horizon. You know, it doesn't have to sell investments after a certain period. So that they've held on to their action holdings. If they'd sold it, you know, a few years ago, as they might have done, they would have lost out massively. So, um, but they seem to have a remarkably good track record with, um, uh, they've had a massive success with action, the discount retailer, but they've got an, a range of other private companies that, that have done extremely well. So, um, uh, you know, mainly growth. So it does actually complement City quite well because it it's kind of more of a growth investor, I, I would say. So but it has got a holding in an infrastructure, through infrastructure fund as well. So, yeah, I know I bought it um, uh, second half of last year and I've been very happy with it so far. So their portfolio is quite different to some of the other more early stage um, private equity trusts. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you talked to the portfolio turnover. You, you showed that some of the recent sales and some of the purchases at the moment, kind of, kind of, coming out of the COVID crisis, has the turnover increased? Is it kind of the same? Are you repositioning the portfolio for a higher inflation, higher interest rate world? Um, yeah, no, the, I, there was a fair amount of portfolio turnover in that sort of second quarter 2020 and the heart of that first lockdown. And I really, I mean, I got out of, we're quite underweight consumer discretion. I got out a lot of the consumer discretion at the time, you know, travel and leisure stocks, uh, retail. I just didn't see dividends coming back quickly. And I felt there were structural issues as well. And I've stuck with that position, which initially when they had the euphoria of a kind of opening up, wasn't the right way to be positioned. But now, you know, the chickens coming home to roost in some of those stocks. And so, you know, it, it means we've been well positioned for the latest phase in the market. So the turnover was quite high for City, you know, which, which is not high for any other fund, but most other funds it was kind of high teens percent during that year, particular year. But it's kind of reverted back to our usual kind of 10 percent per annum roughly as average of purchase and sales. So, you know, we're, 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 we, we are usually a low turnover fund. And um, even when the turnover picks up a bit, it's quite low compared to quite a few other funds. Um, I, I had a question, just a personal one. Um, we had uh, HSBC in the top 10, and on the slide of financials, I didn't see uh, banks in there. HSBC aside, do you have any other banks? Um, do, you, or yes. do, 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 do you not like the banks, or do you like the banks? What, what's your view on the banks? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, so we've got Barclays and Lloyds, so we've got marginal overweights in those two stocks. We're actually underweight in HSBC Relative Index, but we hold it. Um, yeah, the banking sector is looking quite cheap at the moment, and the banks are a particular beneficiary, as I affect our insurance companies, of rising interest rates and the rise of gilt yields. And so that's those are two good reasons to hold them. The problem with the banks, in my experience, is they're just such a political hot potato. I mean, I don't think people in Whitehall or Westminster and other kind of governing capitals around the globe will forget the financial crisis in, for a long time. I mean, they, they hated the way this taxpayer had to bail out the banking sector. And and it's just prone to such interference. And we saw in that first stage of the pandemic, the regulators just told the banks you weren't allowed to pay any dividends. You know, they, they could, they were in position to pay dividends. They just were told they were they weren't allowed to. And um, and if we do tip into a serious recession, which is a possibility, um, the banks will suffer. I mean, they're in a much stronger capital record ratios than than they were pre-financial crisis. But you know, they are highly leveraged institutions still, and um, there's no doubt, you know, bank shareholders suffer during during downturns. So. Um, I, you know, I'm actually realistic. If things stay as they are and the economy ticks along all right, then I think we should get some quite good dividend growth from the banking sector. So I'm sort of comfortable to hold free banks, I do, but I prefer to be play the financials through insurers and other financials rather than through the banks. Thank you. Um, and we've got time for one more question. And um, we've got quite a few more come in, and I'm afraid we've got time for. So thank you for sending them in, and apologies we haven't had the chance to get through them all. Um, but here's a quite quick answer. Um, could you tell us how, how small and market cap size um, or how, how, how far down you can go? Is there a limit by, uh, beyond which it's not, not right for you to invest? Um, 
yeah, it is a struggle to buy into new new stocks um, when when their market cap is kind of 500 million or, or below. I mean, Wing Canton is in that sort of region, and um, it took me a while to build up a stake. And um, you know, it's only it's around kind of 0.4, 0 0.5% of the portfolio. But it, you know, when you're buying a six or seven million pound holding in that type of stock, it, even if that you think the shares are cheap, you know, why aren't people selling it? You know, if, uh, why, why isn't it going any higher? But it, it, um, it still took a while. So, you know, got one or two historic holdings, and I got yeah. some shares in Young and Co, the pub group, um, got the non-voting shares, and that I bought in a placing quite a few years ago. And you know, I'm very happy to hold it. You know, but it, you know, I have to think about liquidity because I, I like to be in things I can both buy and also sell if things you change your mind. And um, so, uh, so we, you know, that I mean, really. Um, it's a sort of billion market cap and over is our main hunting ground. But I, but I did buy Wing Canton this year, which shows that you know when I see something that really ticks all the boxes, I'm very willing to um, to, to to be patient and accumulate a stake. Chad, that's been terrific. Thank you very much indeed for for joining us. And thank you so much, everybody, for listening, and it's um, I've enjoyed participating. <laughs>